didn't cover is the Seedscapes book. And this leads out uh, when we have a point that's not even sound. Um, <coughs> Any questions leading into this of things that we went over last time or you're reading leading into this? Um, all right, the, the, uh, as you can see, we've been working with a number of persons around the world on these issues. This grows out of an international collaborative project for a number of years which started with local governments around the world, 35 countries. Uh, it was called the Fiscal Austerity and Urban Innovation Project. And then led to the Kentuckville Karaoke book as we got to issues of legitimacy, tried to model where and why innovations occur. And we talked about the Jane Jacobs idea. We talked about uh, creative industries, Schumpeter and his hypotheses. Increasingly, as we were looking at local governments and the issues they were discussing, we found they were increasing, they were changing from the past. And this, this is the sort of the broad the broad uh, framework in the in the economy and in the family, the social factors, especially the slimming of the family that I talked about a little bit, in the cultural arena of ideas, we had similar things going on. A move away from a big integrated hierarchy around a, a state or a, and or a party, maybe with unions linked together or differentiation within the economy, different kinds of firms, different in industries, smaller firms. Um, within the family, children, husbands, wives, living more separately, let's say the, the slimming of the family. And that each of these brought more tolerance for individuals and expectations of variations. Uh, in lifestyle, in tolerance, and the like. Uh, within the cultural realm, what's good taste, what's right or wrong, we sense that there are different kinds of people, there are different countries, there are different subcultures, and cultural pluralism is more widespread. Fourth, within the government, the sense that one strong government or one kind of programming policy was too simple, uh, as well as the sense that a one big national government was too far often from local governments, neighborhoods, and individuals. Um, and so in that sense, governments were delegating from the nation to smaller units. Uh, the um, <coughs> Uh, Reagan and Thatcher, I mentioned, were given the credit or the blame for changing this, but I showed you as well. This happened six years before the election of Ronald Reagan. That is, democratic local governments in the U.S. were cutting their budgets. Half, more than half of them were reducing their expenditures from their own revenues as of 1974, six years before Ronald Reagan was elected. Um, that was one of the big findings of the book called City Money. But if we then tried to see where and why, one answer was bottom up. It wasn't, it wasn't strong leaders. It was citizens who mobilized in California and surprised California governors, the governor, the mayors, the whole civic establishment because two-thirds of the citizens said uh, <coughs> that is when the the LA Times did post election interviews they interviewed people and said you work for the you just voted you're work you work for the state of California yes I do 
that how did you vote? I voted in favor of Prop 13. Really? Even though the state of California will get less revenues for your salary, why did you vote for Proposition 13? When the governor and everyone says, do not. And the answer of the, of the state employees was, my home is more important than my job, quote unquote. Okay, so, ta so property taxes on homes had gotten so high, many people said that we want to cut back the state. All right, even though the state of California is pretty tiny in terms of what it does compared to China or France, nevertheless, I then had some Chinese teaching assistants in years after that who said, well, you know, the Chinese welfare state doesn't do that much, really. So we had many discussions of this. Health care, many other issues which you take for granted, uh, retirement. Uh, in some areas, the Chinese welfare state, and, and, the, and at least in some of the calculations in the past, the net tax, the, the total tax burden seem to be lesser or about the same as in the U.S. and lower than in many of the European countries in China. <coughs> okay, uh, the uh, uh, culture was an exception. Culture is an exception. Uh, but the, the, uh, the, the unusual thing that I talked about last time briefly then was the idea that fiscal caution, having the, supporting a government that does less, at the same time that you want liberal social policies, tolerance of women, of gays, of minorities, affirmative action, uh, helping the disadvantaged in general, is very popular among the new political cultural leaders at the same time that they're more fiscally, more fiscally cautious than, than, than in the past. That was new. This was Bill Clinton. This was Tony Blair. This was Francois Mitterrand. This was two-thirds of the citizens of Europe and the U.S. roughly said this is what they wanted when you asked them questions. Same thing, same thing in Japan. Uh, <coughs> but the leaders, what the leaders did really depended a lot on the political parties. And because the parties and the top leaders, especially in Europe, they don't have primary elections. The US and Taiwan and Mexico are the main countries with, with primary elections. They don't have them in most countries of the world. The top party leaders choose their, choose their candidates. <coughs> um, OK, so. The, if this is the background, we'll talk about this a little more in another week or so in, in, with the, the book on the Paul the New Political Leader. leader. New Political Culture is on, it's on the reading list. <laughs> um, we, 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 we went into where and why we had big political changes. Where, where, where do people, that is, how could someone like Tony Blair or, or uh, or Bill, uh, uh, Jim Carter, Bill Clinton, be elected because they contradicted most of the party programs from the past. And the answer was they went to the citizens, they brought in new issues, and they succeeded more locally before they did national. So I went to meetings and I was talking about this before the people in, who, who analyze national politics, and they laughed at me because they said, oh, you don't understand the, the U.S. nationals. The sources of the U.S. nation come from the locals. Look at the mayors to understand the U.S. and the world more deeply and more subtly. <coughs> and and the, the sources I mentioned once before, Ronald Reagan had did polls every night, first president to do so. How's the president doing? Doing or how, what are your feelings about the president <laughs> and so forth? When he talked about cutting taxes, people said. <laughs> when he talked about his social program, school prayer, yes, all children should pray, should pray in God every day and so forth. Um, uh, sex education, no, 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 we shouldn't have any sex education in schools. And the third was, I guess, abortion. People were not behind Reagan. So his pollsters and his advisors said, 
don't talk about those social issues. And he still did. So the social issues, people, so the, where could you get this new combination of issues from new leaders? You did not get it in strong parties at the top. You got it in weak party systems at the bottom. So we had Mayor Peter Flaherty, on whom there is a, a chapter in the book called the, by, by the, on the book called the New Political Culture. Peter Flaherty in, in Pittsburgh managed to get elected because he attacked the he attacked the he, he was he was against the business elite, etc. I won't go into the detail, but I'll simply say social issues emerged. And as distinct from fiscal issues, and the social issues needed to be analyzed more carefully to make sense of them. So over the over a couple of years, we started analyzing these social issues, and they were they were measured with items like what kinds of civic organizations are you a member of? Get national surveys of, of, of citizens around the world, and what issues do you favor or do you not favor, like abortion or uh, uh, women's rights, etc. And the, the finding was that many of the organizations supporting these things, including uh, the Kiwanis Club and Boy Scouts and the like, were going down. This was the big finding of finding a button in his, in his ball in the long book. So we, we, we then we looked at the data of Putnam more closely. And so Peter Ockerberg came to Chicago, we spent the summer, uh, we analyzed the data and we found there's a huge, there's one huge exception, and that's what's on the board. And Peter just happened to be from the Netherlands, and the Netherlands is the is the yellow line, the US is the red line. Education, arts, music, and music and cultural activities are taking off, even though everything else is going down. Putnam didn't have this in his book, nobody paid attention to this. Um, I mentioned that a little bit, but this was potential dynamite, and it still is. Internationally, if we look at more countries, the same kind of thing. This is the amount of change. Delta is the change from, from uh, the first year, I think, here to the last year. Uh, 81 to 90, anywhere, 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 okay. So here are the changes. The biggest change in the Netherlands, that is, these are increasing participation in the arts and culture. Um, who is doing this in terms of age? Young people, 16 to 24 year olders were the 15 or 16. They were the most active in these new organizations. They're starting their own, their own bands. They're starting uh, stand-up co comedy shows. They're starting all kinds of clubs on college campuses, even before, etc. And they, they're not going to the, and the older people are participating uh, less, not, or not increasing. What kinds of amenities are these? What are, what are the kinds of organizations that are going up and going down? Electronic music, huge. Traditional arcades and amusement parks going down. Uh, zoos are going down. So we get, we're get we getting differentiations within and among these particular amenities, that is, Social issues is too simple as well. So we began to say, how do these amenities, these different kinds of activities, cluster? What joins them together? Is it the economy? Are they really driven? Is, is there an underlying driver, which is wealth in the economy? That's one hypothesis, in which case these should be cyclical. And in good times, they all should go up. In bad times, they should go down. But if you look at leisure and hospitality, does it go down when there's a, a cyclical change in the economy from, I can't read that number at the bottom. Okay, so this is, 19, this is 1919. All the way through the Great Depression in the 1930s, etc. This is growing. This is a sectoral change, not a cyclical change. And 
these are becoming, these have become much more important than they were. Question? Could that partially be explained by the fact that like manufacturing and agriculture have become much more efficient, so people like need some work, right? And, yeah. Yes, definitely, but that would explain the whole service sector. This is more specifically the leisure and hospitality sector within services. So services could be lawyers who are helping, you know, sue your company, sue each other. That is, they could be doctors who are who are uh, taking care of you, which are not leisure and hospitality. So this is a this is a narrow this is a subsector of the bigger service sector. And the service sector, you, you would think, wouldn't be as positive in terms of the trend. It, it's not. It's not as positive. No, it's not as positive. It's not as consistent, and it's partially cyclical. It's driven. It's closer to the general economy than is the leisure and hospitality sector. Um, and we didn't know this in advance. Uh, we weren't. We weren't looking for this, as I said. <coughs> um, the ideas of or so how to link this with neoclassical economics with Alfred Marshall with Keynes. Uh, Gary, okay, so the, that's fact, that's line one. Land, labor, capital, and management drive economic growth. Economic growth attracts population. People move to jobs. People leave the farm, they go to Detroit. People leave the, the, the rural areas of China, they go to the big cities, Beijing. Okay, that's line one. Gary Becker added human capital. Talent, smart ideas make a difference and they make economic growth more efficient. With the same capital, you, you build more, more flexes. We don't, we accept all that, but we add the amenity model, which says, where does the human capital move and live? Why are you here at this university rather than staying in your home countries or your hometown? Because people migrate and move around for education, for jobs, and they go in part for the job and also for, as we show, people who just gotten university degrees, college degrees, change jobs in the U.S. about more than once a year. So when people have just finished their degrees, they get, they, they move, they change jobs. They don't always move physically because if you know that you may change jobs, if you go to New York, Chicago, or LA, where there are lots of job choices, you can move from job to job without moving from city to city necessarily. Okay, so the amenities, which are more concentrated in New York, Chicago, and LA, and bigger, bigger locations, tend to be positive drivers of human capital, which in turn leads to more economic growth. That's why Chicago Fest can drive the Chicago economy. Okay, again, I, when I first said this to the foundations and people in Chicago, they, they laughed. Or they ignored this. It's ridiculous. This is the city of big shoulders. We're tough. We're union people. That's what drives the economy. So, well, maybe, maybe not. Who did, how much, how much are the factories with the union people growing? The steel mills are going down, etc. Where is the new growth? It's on the north side, the near west side, Boys Town, the around the Cubs Stadium, young college graduates. <coughs> uh, doubling in population size. The rents are going up 300% in those areas and more. So there's a desirability of what the Tribune said, we don't want no yuppies in my bar. Okay. Yuppies was taken as a clearly something that is clashing with traditional Chicago culture. Whereas in Washington, New York, LA, the term wasn't used at the beginning. The clash with the classic Chicago, you asked the question, my answer was the Irish. The Irish bar bartenders who led the bars, who sold insurance, who were the priestly captains in the party. And the Catholic Church reinforced through the Catholic schools a sense of we are distinctive and we don't like these folks who are 
reading the Wall Street Journal and drinking a Starbucks coffee while they walk their dog. Okay? Um, that has changed. But that, that, was, that was the image 20, 30 years ago. But the fact that we now have mayors, let's say Rahm Emanuel most, most visibly, who was in, was in clear, was much closer to the young urban profession. <laughs> Lori Lightfoot is more, com more, more complicated. But she still, I think she has a USC law degree. And she's, she's, she's pretty sophisticated. OK. How do we make sense of this, this stuff? <laughs> What's the scene? Five elements we have here. Neighborhood structures, people, values. What makes different scenes different? Like a bar, like a neighborhood where yuppies are not welcome, or the north side where people may want to live, and where they live is important because it keeps them from going to LA or Tokyo, or they may attract people here from Tokyo. And then how do these scenes hold together, or, what, or what's, what are, what are, what's a scene? We start with these three big ideas, legitimacy, theatricality, and authenticity, and then within them, five dimensions under each. Traditionalism, self-expression, yeah, so if we take, Max Weber has three of these. Max Weber had tradition, charisma, um, and really, you got them in uh, the, the bureaucracy, the tradition, and charisma. We add self-expression and egalitarianism. Brother. These are new over the 20th century, and they fit more with the well, the French Revolution for equality. But they they've added more a sense of self-expression. This has become more visibly important through the arts. The, self, the arts are the quintessential example of self-expression, of drawing. A six and eight-year-old kid, you know, draw a picture. That's the beginning of self-expression, the sense of, of interpreting this, and that individuality is something to be positively paid attention to, which is different in the different schools and progressive school systems. Okay, then the second one, theatricality. Uh, in turn, has neighborliness, transgression, exhibition. And that is, each of these are arranged. So you have a po high positive or high negative on these. And third, authenticity, which can be localism, ethnic, and many different types. So these are our 15 dimensions. Um, we start with the, the Tocquevillian idea uh, that participation generates trust. And then we add to that. These are the two, the two big themes of conductual karaoke, the book we talked about last time. <coughs> we add Balzac, Bowler, Schumpeter, Jane Jacobs. Bohemia generates innovation and urban growth. Both of these can grow stronger by adding scenes of the arts illustrated in the book, which we talked about. OK, then this is a summary, in a sense, of the, of the participation idea. Line one is Tocqueville. Tocqueville works in Northwest Europe, in the Protestant countries, in the sense that if you're higher on participation, you're higher on trust. In Latin America, you're low in participation, you're low on trust. So that fits the proposition. However, in Asia, starting in Japan, zero. Korea, zero. People participate more, they don't build trust. Why not? What's different? What's wrong, What's wrong with this model? Um, <coughs> they're non-civic non -civic variables. What else is going on here? And there may be some people, so we talked about this last time. Bottom line of the four there was, remember, what? What's an example? What's an example in the West? Anybody need to read the book or guess? Why might people who participate more in civic activities have build less trust through their participation? What organization might you actively participate in and it gives you less and less trust in, your, in, in, the, in the government and in people more broadly? Gangs, unions, mafia. 
Okay. Okay. But <coughs> uh, the point is, we this is not that is if we try to say what <coughs> instead of saying Asia is different or Brazil is different from Argentina as I as I said before and from Colombia, the question is why. What makes, what are the analytical variables that make Brazil different? And that's where we get to the specifics here, <coughs> um, which, and to generalize beyond the, the, the label China, what about China? Which factors, because China is so many mixed together things. That's why we need the individual amenities, and that's why we need not just one one thing and call it a scene, we need separate dimensions to, to say which of these work in what ways. Okay, and so uh, the rise of culture, remember, okay, so these are now cultural activities, so, so we identified as I showed you, we look at types of civic activities, types of values and so, and so forth, Culture and the arts were really different from the rest, but where, so this, this is the same thing I showed in the bar chart before, so you don't need to look at the, the little, the little, except, the, well, they are ranked. Uh, I can interpret this more if you, if you want, but that, that's the bottom line. We then have things around the arts, so, so then, so we began studying the arts. How's the arts work, especially for politics and the political and social decisions? Arts can add buzz. Arts can talk about, can, can give you a sense of excitement that, that um, Bill Clinton is a, is a cool guy because he goes to Hollywood and he plays his, his uh, musical instrument with African American bands and others who come to the White House. There's a sense of doing things and, and Bill, Bill Clinton was particularly talented at finding ways of connecting with and leveraging, that is, he, he thought in part in these, in these terms fairly, fairly explicitly. Um, uh, but, okay. So if we look then at the classic ways, in, uh, the classic, say, industrial pattern here, this is, this is close to Marx. Money is a driving resource at the bottom line. Firms, producers, this is the production economy. The goal is work and products. In the political arena, you want collective action, and the citizens elect leaders, the power centers, ideology, their parties, their issues of citizenship. Power is the resource that people focus on. In a residential neighborhood, people want their, their services, they want housing, they want schools, safety, sanitation. The agents are residents, homes. Trust in your neighbors is important. Okay, all that is the past. Everybody knows that. What we're adding is the first. In addition to these, what does the cultural scene add? People walking around the downtown area shopping on Saturday and Sunday. People going to church and seeing their friends. People in an open way, not primordial attachments of race, class, gender, and national origin, but scenes you can walk into and walk out of. You can choose individually. You're attracted by buzz. Hey, did you hear about the show going on at such and such a place? Or there's a sale, or there's a, there's a, there's a great um, musical performance, or an inch, inch, the, the most, okay. Um, the drivers are consumers, not producers. They're not residents. So the consumer is a driver. Um, amenities attract them, not just jobs, but also amenities. Lifestyle sensibilities are the basis of the social bond where people see each other. They may have loose social bonds or they may just be more distant, not close intimate friends necessarily. But the goal is expressing and communicating feelings, experiences, moods. These become captured in films, in scenes where you can, you can, you can have a dinner or not. You can sit in a cafe. You can 
meander in a bookstore. You can walk in a street and take a walk through a park. This is this shocked all the Parisians. Said this in our traditional city of Paris. This is garish. It was deliberately garish. It was deliberately put up to shock and say, we're going to do new things with the arts in Paris. And they, and, and at the beginning, it, it had that reputation. Over about 10 years, it now attracts more visitors than the, than the Eiffel Tower and the Louvre combined. Why? It's cool. They don't, they have movie, they, they have art exhibits, they have movies, they have restaurants, they have lectures, they have a library. In the movies, they don't have chairs like this, they have mats and you can lie on the floor. The movies they show are not Hollywood blockbusters, they're sort of cool, ironic, uh, hip uh, kind, kinds, of, kinds of things that capture a, a distinctive style. But these don't immediately necessarily appeal to everyone. Is this Bourdieu's elite? No, this was built by people who said, we want to bring in people with less education as well as more education. And we're going to find ways to do that. And one thing they did was to build on, and there is two books by one of the one of the top French or French cultural experts on this now, Laurent Fleury. Where is he? Let me put his name up here. <coughs> and I, I teach a course which includes a lot of this stuff. First was called the the, Na the National Theater, TNP, Théâtre National Populaire. <coughs> And then this is the, 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 the book, this is called the, the Beaubourg Center, the, or the uh, Centre Georges Pompidou, named after the president of France. Okay, the TNP built the model with its, with its director, who was a communist, who worked with the Communist Party, but he wanted to appeal to, to blue-collar workers. The theater was not in downtown Paris, it was in a working-class, blue-collar suburb where he wanted to have real people come to his plays. They would play Shakespeare, Moliere, but they would do it ah, you know, in a new way. Then he would work with the Communist Party cell groups, and after or before the show, where the cell meetings were required, everybody would discuss the play. And he would either, he sometimes, he the director, or they would have actors, they would show up and they'd say, yeah, you know, this is really about how the working class was being destroyed. It's because they would link the themes of the Communist Party with the play in ways that the party said, yes, come to the play and you'll really understand. That's a little bit like what I put on the board at the end last time. Stalin. Stalin made movies. The TNP, they wanted the hearts and minds. Why did Napoleon enter Russia and get to Egypt? Because he had the hearts and minds of the citizens in the army. Okay. <laughs> so some smart leaders realized this, even if most social scientists have not, still today. Okay. And many, many people, many Americans will say, where's the beef? You know, meaning the job, the money, the interest, okay, <laughs> meaning usually economic, okay. Um, I, uh, we had three collaborator, collaborators at the beginning, Dan Silver was a student, Larry, uh, Larry Raphael was a professor of comparative literature. I sought out because I wanted to talk to someone who was knew more about the arts and, and, and me. And Larry was in Paris. He got to know Steve, Steve, uh, uh, Steve Sawyer. Steve Sawyer uh, is an American with a degree in history. He did a PhD on the city of Paris in the 19th century. And he, but he teaches courses in political science, in, in uh, planning, 
and he does general urbanism and he, and he consults with, 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 with the government and people in, in France and Paris. So he, he and I found a, a request for proposals from the mayor's office of Paris to study neighborhoods and their vitality, including especially low-income neighborhoods where people in the, in, the, in, the, in the old suburbs were fighting with, were, were you know, burning cars, and were angry with the administration and the national government. So we put in a proposal and we beat the French. We had three years of funding. We did, we did one, pay, one, one long report, uh, <coughs> cartography of the city of Paris. So I'll give you a few things from Paris just to show you that this is not just Chicago, although the, we, we, we built this up from US and Chicago data before we went, before we went to Paris. This is, um, yeah, this is basically, the, the simple point of this is, the city of Paris is, 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 is uh, called 75, it's the zip code 75, it's the downtown, the rest, they're, they're big suburban areas, it's, a, it's the metropolitan area of Paris, it's called Greater Paris, the Grand Paris. Classic driver, income, how strong and where, where, or where do high income people live? The, the darker left lines are the, are the, are the rich areas. If we looked at the individual amenities, a whole bunch of them, some of them listed there, they don't fall just where the high income people are. They're more in the general downtown area of Paris, whereas those, those richer suburban areas as well are not very active in terms of organization or of these amenities. And if we then get to more specific types of amenities, glamour is moderately important here but uh, only moderate, and we'll show more on that in a second. Um, if we look at this cross-nationally, how much does, is, is, uh, are these three dimensions of exhibitionism, glamour, and charisma, on the far right you see that, that's, that's the, the, their labels. How much do these three different colors relate to income? or rent in the in the rent cost in the in the area the answer in the U is that the, in the u.s the correlations are about 0.1 or less in canada they're a little bit higher in spain they're the highest that is richer people in spain do more there are people in neighborhoods which with, with higher income have more glamorous amenities and more exhibition system amenities in korea it's the opposite. The areas with, with the more glamorous activity are lower in, lower in, 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 in income. But the, the main point is, is these are not the same. Even, in, in, and we're now trying, we're trying we've been, up, this last summer we're updating this. And it looks as if this is because we had too few cases for Spain. And as we get a larger number, we only had big metro areas and maybe 70 of them. When we get more data for smaller geographic units in Spain, we think that, we're, that, that that's partially the reason for the Spanish difference, but we don't, don't know yet. Um, these, are, these are the numbers. The, 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 the main point of this, if you look at the magnitude of the numbers, if you, if you square these, so with the first one, 0.2, you multiply 0.2 times 0.2, and what do you get? 0.04. That's 4%, 4% of the variance between traditional performance and rent is shared. That is, income only explains 4% of the measure of tradition. If we go down to glamour, glamour is 11. Square 11, you know, glamour is in the US is minimally related to income of the neighborhood. Uh, but other scenes dimensions vary considerably. Take egalitarianism, it's higher in the blue collar, lower status areas, which, which, you, which you would expect. Uh, but if we look for new patterns, and the French don't think this is new, the French think, oh, this is new, this is, this is a French word. Bohème bourgeois. They, they think this was invented, this is, this is invented by the USC undergraduate 
who now writes for the New York Times, and he's a trustee here, named David Brooks. Bobo's in Paradise was his book, and the French and many people around the world use this, and it includes people who are a little more transgressive, but who also are higher in income. I and mean, when you combine those things, this is not at all just income. These are the, the cool people who are the, who are the leaders. They, they, they get dressed up. Ladies get dressed up, or say younger women, let's say you get dressed up, covered in silver, you know, very tight fitting or sprayed with silver. Then they'll stand in front of the boat, the Beauvoir Center for two hours. And people will come and take photographs of these. Wow, look at that. We also, there's a lady who does this in downtown Chicago, right? In the interview. So the point is, we're getting new kinds of aesthetic creations driven by the arts uh, illustrated some illustrating some of that and we have a film on the underground the Paris underground and how how it works uh, which is done by one of our Paris collaborators which I, I think uh, we have a, I think we have a link to on, on that. Uh, yes we, can, we have lots of links to it. Uh, Bobo comes from multiple dimensions <coughs> We even took a popular song and took the words from the song and then showed how these dimensions listed in the song relate to our Bobo. Uh, and these are their dimensions over on the right. It would be too small for me to read, but I, I'm, I'm saying, how do, we, how do we identify a new concept? Look at things like songs where people are talking about it. It's, it's a, is a good way to start social science. Okay, this is more to show you that our, 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 our Parisians really went wild with their colors, with looking at these multiple dimensions, uh, and we got we got lots of data and lots of ways of mapping these things. Uh, but they and but but the point is, it's not as if there's one dimension: rich, poor, black, white, good, bad, gay, not bad. There are many different dimensions of scenes. That's the main message. That scenes are multi-dimensional. There are many different kinds of people in many different kinds of neighborhoods, even within Paris. Okay, if we then go back in turn to the raw data, and here we have New York, Chicago, and LA. How, where do these things come from? How can we build these fancy maps? <coughs> we started, uh, we, well, we have three big data sources for most of the countries. There's seven or eight countries participating that listed on the, on the cover. China, North Korea, oh sorry, sorry. <laughs> South Korea, not North Korea yet. Uh, they just do basketball. Uh, South, South Korea, Japan, France, Spain, uh, US, Canada, and Poland. <laughs> uh, little bits on Germany, uh, Berlin. Uh, in general, we aim for census data on what's called BISIP, which is the business section or the it's industrial categories, as many as we can get. Uh, in China, we've got the number of people who are, who are, um, um, uh, who are repairing vending machines. Pretty, pretty, this is not just services, not just, I mean, you're getting, we can get some very refined, within the U.S. we have human rights organizations, we have unions, we have environmental organizations for 45,000 zip codes. This is dynamite, nobody used this before we, we, we found it. It's not published, it's only online, and, and, we, we've been, and, it's, and those, are the, those are the things that are mostly shown here. The third thing are the yellow pages. We downloaded, we didn't interview people, sorry, well, this, this, sorry. The, the example here. We download from the yellow pages lots of categories of the yellow. Then you can get every individual retail institution, including churches, including cafes, including restaurants, by name for, for everywhere with their zip codes and their street address. Um, the third source we, is, is what Putnam used, and then we've adapted as well. Then we get only down at the county level, which is the DDB, it's a survey of citizens which asks them things like which, what kinds of organizations do you belong to? Um, uh, uh, are you a couch potato? 
And, and many people say yes. Okay. Uh, Etc. Do you see it? I mean, are you are you uh, you know what are you are you a sort of are you a cultural leader or follower? Things like that. Are you the uh, and then and I am the car I drive. It's one of the items. So we've got style, taste, consumption, practices, feelings. These are the three big things. So this, this is mostly, this, I think this is both yellow pages and, maybe yellow pages and, um, yeah, this is yellow pages and um, um, visit. <coughs> okay, number one on the far left is pizza restaurants. Number two in the U.S. only, Baptist churches. Bookstores, Chinese restaurants, cafes, Catholic, okay, for Catholic churches, take a look at the three cities. When we did this, Chicago had 763 Catholic churches. I said, I, I said this, presented this last fall, a woman who's working on this said, you know, there are only 300 left. In four or five years, the church is closing down many of these neighborhood churches. Okay, so... These things change, but these are important dynamics for neighborhood analysis. Okay, how to make sense of them. Pentecostal churches, remember your Brazilian study? Okay, these are, these are there in, in detail. So let's take one which, which you don't get in probably any of your, any? Anybody have a social science course where they talk about this kind of G word? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, we score positively designer boutiques, nightclubs with VIP Prada, Gucci, uh, movie openings, design schools. We give a, a, a negative score to the things at the bottom. We create, we, this was si very simple, very crude coding. We just have a five point scale. This concept. Uh, is essential, and in this example, express expressivity for experimental music, the traditionalism for heritage sites, glamour for couture shows, essential, desirable but not determinative alone, traditionalism is used, and, and uh, rare books for neutral, that is we score each amenity like a pizza, like a pizza parlor, <coughs> high to low on each of these 15 dimensions. And this is then, then well, we started be, be, yeah, before we had these 15 dimensions. I did an essay where, where we talked about this and, I, and I, I, wrote up, I wrote up the stuff across the top. This was draft one. I said, what's a scene? What do you think of it? So my idea was say, Disney heaven, the ideal suburban American clean, pretty, or a Disney, a Disney site, as in Florida and California. Everybody's pretty, everybody's nice, there's no dirt, nobody's sick, etc. Uh, Renoir's Loge, the painting of the elite looking down and enjoying the performance. La La Land, Tinsel, Gary Becker's Buzz, um, Rossini's Tour, Bogner's fault. So these were things that I that I sort of laid out. Then I said, these are, then after we worked with these for a couple of years, I said, you know, these are more European and American. Let's look for things that are more international and abstract and can be recombined anywhere in the world. But we were still read a couple of years, Dan Silver led, 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 led in, in doing this, generating this list down the left. And these are our 15 that are, that are, that are the core of the book. Now, but we're, I'm showing the others to say you can recombine. If once you've got these 15 down the left, you can score anything else you want to take, such as a, a rural library in a small town in China, and then say, how does that score? And you would say it would be high on localism. It would be high on um, uh, traditionalism, uh, and so forth. It might be low on um, exhibitionism and glamour, etc. So in that way, we can we can have a this is a crosswalk from these more abstract dimensions to, to different kind. That is, we can combine and recombine these 15 dimensions with one another 
in many different ways. And we do this in, we do this in the book, and this, this is the same, same basic thing. To take one of the most widely discussed ideal types. This is Balzac, Baudelaire, this is Jane Jacobs, this is uh, uh, <coughs> the idea that Bohemia should drive economic growth. Jane Jacobs, Schumpeter, that kind of idea, which is Florida. Uh, <coughs> and so we then say, how do we measure a Bohemian scene in terms of the data we have for 45,000 zip codes? So we have not just, we don't just have one dimension like a pizza parlor, we use all of our scenes variables, all of the amenities, the, 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 we, use, we use all of these and we, we add them all up and based on having all of them, we then say one neighborhood gets a score on traditionalism, on self-expression, on utilitarianism and so forth. And then the neighborhood score on those, we then say, how does that match an ideal typical profile? And this, in the ideal typical profile, we define this by comparing this with the literature of, say, Balzac's and, and Baudelaire's essays. Or Jane Jacobs says, if you're Bohemian, this is, this is how you ought to be. You should be more self-expressive. You should be more um, charismatic and those get fives, and you should be transgressive. By contrast, you should not be the state, you should not be corporate. Those get negative scores of one and two. Okay, so in that way we can create ideal typical scenes and then match them up with some of the data we have in this, in this matter. Then we can, we can do multiple regressions and say how strongly can, does, does Bohemia predict economic growth or other things like that. Um, so this, this then we, we push on as a, as a half diagram of a core model actually used in the last, this is the last chapter of Kentucky Karaoke. What the one point of this is to say that scenes are often not big direct effects. Scenes often transform they interact with, as shown by these arrows, um, age, education, income, so forth, in affecting democracy as well as the other big variable, economic development, uh, in the in the Kentucky karaoke book. In the in the Seascapes book, we have about nine or so standard dependent variables, but these then vary within the, the three within the three main substantive chapters. And uh, I won't try to go into too much of this as I want to... Okay, yeah, this, this is a, a quick, simple way of, of uh, showing it. Silicon Valley, <coughs> or the Chinese or the Indian, big, or uh, Grenoble, France. We have a strong computer, high-tech industry cluster. Why does Silicon Valley work? Is it the tech, is it, is it the location of the job? Is it the say, I mean, I love, you know, Apple and the company, the company makes me that way and or is it the fact that outside of Apple and also nearby you have more cafes and restaurants and places that can congregate and people can talk and related with the culture that says this is okay to do. By contrast, there have been there's several books which contrast this with Boston. The Boston Route 128 outside had a lot of high-tech industry and they were competing with Silicon Valley. Boston lost. The, the, big, the, big firm, the biggest one was DEC and the DEC firm, uh, Ron Berger studied it and worked with him for a year. The DEC firm said, you know, you can't talk, you can't talk to anybody at any other company. You can't go to, you can't, if you go to a restaurant, a, a bar, you can't talk about your work in any of these ideas. You'll be fired. That is, each company wanted its control of its own secrets. Silicon Valley was the opposite. Much more open, much more sharing of ideas and of drinking, karaoke, whatever, uh, in ways that they could talk to other people. Self-expression, so scenes that promote and legitimate self-expression 
drove much more economic development, jobs, patents, and human capital. That, that, that's the idea of the seed. So we don't say that technology doesn't matter. We're saying technology can have much more impact if you combine it with a scene where it is legitimate and visible and active. Okay. Um, then, which comes first? That's a bit, not the first question everybody asks. How do we answer this? We get data on both of these things for as many years as we can. Annual data on these kinds of things. So these are the arts jobs data that measure arts activities in a local area. Um, and then we, we look at time one and time two. Or sorry, or T and T, 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 T minus one. T is the is the is the is the year is the the, the that should be T okay so bit, bit, well it should be T T plus one really basically but we look at we look at the at the at each of these arrows and we measure each each of these uh, with these equations be as simplified a little bit at the bottom these are these are um, um, general equations. We want to see how x and y are, are standardized. No, b, b, beta and y are standardized coefficients from the from the regressions, and which one is bigger? So that is, the, 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 the key the key paths are the diagonals. That is, how much do total jobs <coughs> drive arts jobs, or how much do art jobs in the earlier period drive total jobs? And what's the ratio of the one to the to the other coefficient? Uh, that's that was one. Of, that's one of the key questions. And instead of saying America is this, we say it depends on the zip code. And from New York to Boston, and around let's say from LA to San Francisco on the coast. And part around, part, 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 parts around, say the, up, the upper left especially makes sense. Parts of, that is, the red areas, the arts are drivers more than the opposite. By contrast, in the American South and the small towns of the Midwest, and over there, are parts of Pennsylvania, uh, <coughs> um, arts are driven by other kinds of jobs. They come, at least in the simple sense of which comes first. And if so, if you have, so the, the idea is that, so then, so, okay, um, bo bobo boboness. We multiply rent by transgression. Scenes and voting. People have high income in Hollywood, but they vote for the Democrats. Job growth. This is this is what we had. We had this when we first had this. We couldn't believe it of how strong this was. That is, what drives total jobs? What makes the economy boom in the U.S. and then and now we've repeated this in many other countries. And, and we're and we and this, I'd say this is maybe the most important single compelling finding of that we believe for me is going to begin again. We've got to cut this again and again and again. What drives jobs? Arts. Arts jobs, and so if you just re reread the text, what explains job growth from 1998 to 201 in all U.S. zip codes? Number one variable, arts jobs in the, at time one. Number two is education. Insignificant crime, cost of living, and county population size. That's the opposite of what you read in the journals of urban economics, urban geography, urban sociology. The traditional variables are there. We try them out, we test them, and they explain either less or they're insignificant compared to arts and compared to, um, then we have the top three variables are glamour, tradition, and egalitarianism, our three C's dimensions. And glamour is a driver of arts jobs in ways that 
the traditional variables or not? Or Alfred Blank? Okay. Um, then we get the scenes and new social movements. Environmentalism, um, human rights. Where are these more important? And uh, okay. the, the, the dynamite finding here was, where do you get more of these kinds of organizations? Classic, vari classic variables that people would talk about, education uh, and the income. We added education, we, so we have a model, this comes from a bigger regression, so we have 15 variables we control, but the one which was new was walking. The more people walk in the neighborhood, the more environmental and other organizations you have. If, if people are more active in a scene, they see one another, they, they're more sensitive to poverty, they're more sensitive to the dirt or the, the whatever in the streets, they want to clean it up and they join an environmental organization and they, they, they recycle better, et cetera. So, self, so the impact of walking is about the same as education. That is, the, it's, it's about, that is, and that, that's dynamite for, for something in, in that literature. Okay, so it's a scene character. It's not to say education doesn't matter. Education certainly matters, but if you combine it with walking, and then if you combine it with the number of arts jobs in the area, both walking and arts jobs enhance the impact of um, education on, 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 uh, on environmental organizations. Yeah. Appreciate this information. But I'm thinking in my head, like, what about a city like San Francisco, where, uh, you know, seven by seven miles, everybody walks, well, no, 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 but, no, but within San Francisco, some, people, some, 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 some areas are crowded with people all the time, and others are the opposite. So we get data at the, you know, as low a level as we can, not just a whole, not just a city or a metro, we get down to neighborhoods. Yeah. So you get, you get right around the, the Golden Gate Bridge, you get, you get, you get to areas where there are lots of tourists, where there are lots of people going to the restaurants, all those restaurants in San Francisco, on the on the sort of the, the northeast side, those are crowded all the time, day and night. Many other areas of San Francisco may be residential, and people may go home, and then but they're not walking in the street. And so, so even within San Francisco, they're important. What you're saying though, that like the higher the walkability, the translates kind of into like the cleaning the streets, too, right? But the higher the walkability, the higher the walk, the higher the, the actual walking. That is, walkability is a sort of <coughs> Is a term used to capture how 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 short are the blocks yeah, yeah. and how and how um, how many streets are there like that? Yeah. <laughs> what are the geographic physical factors? We measure it with percentage of people who and this is a, this is a crude. It's an under measured, un, an, an under reported measure. It's the percentage of people who say, how, how do you get to work? And they say, if I walk, then that, that that's the item. It's actual walking to work. And that, that's the only thing that's available for the U.S. and international. Um, but yes, with I mean, better data, more refined measures, adding other controls are things which you are invited to play with and explore. And as we are doing, we've had, we've had about 60 student papers which have done things like that. And it gets refined as we learn. I mean, I learn from you. I learn from students every couple years. So that's great. Um, okay, that's that's the show. Um, why don't I, I stop there for more questions, comments? And if we can also try to link this with the other things in the course, if those are if those are not clear. Yes. So um, you you definitely convinced me on the kind of idea. Uh, regarding the importance of arts and culture, um, generally speaking, to kind of development. Um, but I'm wondering kind of, um, just obviously to some extent, that can be kind of fostered through policy, right? Funding, you know, the new art center, stuff like that. It also seems like um, it also has to do with kind of the natural expression of the, of the population, right? It has to be kind of um, occurring on its own. If you just talk about like to, to to what extent could you really use policy to um, drive kind of 
a new new development of arts and culture in, in, to what extent it, are there limitations on that? Okay. I mean that, that this is one of the biggest questions that it, that informs a lot of this work we've done for 12 years. And this this is this is the, this, the way you framed it is exactly the way they talk in France and China. In the U.S., people say, "How does the market work?" And and if you measure as as, you, as we did in many of those pizza parlors, Baptist churches, and things, if people don't like a, pe a, a, a pizza parlor or they don't like a cafe, or they don't like a glamorous shoe store or a women's boutique. When you walk around the city of Chicago, walk around anywhere else, they close down all the time. They change all the time. David, David uh, Birch, and I worked on this stuff at MIT, <coughs> uh, 20, no, 66 percent of new jobs in the U.S. are created by firms with 20 or, 20 or fewer employees. Same thing is true in Western Europe where it's been measured. Elsewhere. Little firms are the drivers. How many of those little firms are still alive after 10 years? About 30 percent. 70 percent, 60, 70 percent of the new firms die within 10 years, or they're taken over by a bigger firm and maybe consolidated. But the point is, there's a lot of market activity, and including in the last 20 years, more visibly, in China and. Uh, Russia. So in that sense, we're, we're, we're in, but at the same time, so these are more the private sector. When we work with the Ministry of Culture data in China, they say, you know, we don't, we don't include cinemas, we don't include cafes because those are the private sector. We do include libraries, museums, and cultural centers. So we've analyzed those in, in China. We've got good data for things like the number of books that are taken out, the number of number of theatrical performances, the number of different shows they have in the public facilities within China. So we've got uh, we've got good measures for regressions that that do show the same kind. That is where you have these public institutions doing more. They attract more people. As, and younger people, and they in, they seem to in, with, they seem to because we don't have good we don't have good enough data on this yet uh, to be higher higher in income. Okay, so the, the but the specific dynamics we're still in the process of modeling and looking 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 for further work. But it, but but yes, I mean that's that's the one of the big policy. Big, but the question is whose policy and how much is it investors? How much is it a national government like the NEA? How much is it local entrepreneurs like the Chicago Theater was a rundown was a rundown place that was closed, and then under the Harold Washington administration, there was, was a young attorney who said, "I want to renovate the Chicago Theater," and he borrowed, he got some money, and they borrowed it, and so you've got the cinema. The cinema it's, it's both a theater and a, and a cinema and it's one of the landmark down, down, downtown sites. So you can have a mixture of entrepreneurship plus government funding uh, as well as uh, things which are, are highly local such as a new, we, we asked members of the, we, you know, we got a survey with the results of Sierra Club members. The average member of the Sierra Club belongs to seven other environmental organizations, many of them local. So you can get a concentration of, of environmental activity, and much of it is very, very local. So, and so we don't have, a, that is, what we do find, I don't, I don't have a slide for this right, right here, when we, when, what we're finding is these separate scenes, okay, I'll, I'll just, I'll, yeah, no, I, I, I put it on the board about, I put it on the board a session or two back. These scenes, these 15 dimensions, not a week, so I, I put on the board maybe four or five of them, are increasingly, in the last five presidential elections, they are predicting presidential voting. They did not predict, they, weren't, they were unrelated to presidential voting five, 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 uh, uh, five times four, 20 years ago. <coughs> um, um, but the, the um, uh, they have become, 
how strong, point, point 0.2, point 0.3, and they're not deterministic, but people are segregating themselves by these, these kinds of scenes characteristics, and they're voting accordingly to some degree. Yeah. And you're including church? In yes. That yeah, the, 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 the BISIP includes religious organizations. The Yellow Pages has about, well, the Yellow Pages has about 15 that, we down, that we've separated. And we've got, we've got county level data for about 120 religious denominations, Jehovah's Witnesses, etc. So in the grand scheme of looking at this through uh, the lens of our arts and cultures, churches within that narrative, or you know, yeah. religious. <coughs> our concept at the beginning was amenities. Mm -hmm. The economists define amenities as a non market uh, good or service. So if you get if you get clean air, if you get public education, if you get uh, those are amenities because you don't pay a fee or a charge. They're public goods. Uh, so amenity, amenities are non-market transactions. So we started with those and we tried we, we started with, with a, a big list but then, as we analyzed them more, we found, hey, the arts are different from the other from the other things. Not only not only paying, but also different kinds of of, of so. So now we've classified them as narrowly narrowly artistic, and then broader artistic, and in, 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 in multiple ways. So that's our a couple of that is there are hand there may be 15 people in the world who are working on this stuff seriously now. I guess I'm very few, but, but it's happening. How Putnam says that you know, besides the family for civic participation, he considers the church, you know, religious organizations to be the most mobilizing uh, organization in, yes. in the U.S. In the U.S., that, that, that's the important line. In France, it's the opposite. In France, nobody goes to church. <laughs> right. I mean, it's a. Okay. In Italy, they do. They go to church. They just don't believe in God or. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And do you but, think that has to do with like secularization? Yes. No, I mean, in the secularization that this was in France, they call it republicanism. Republicanism meant we're using the state. I mean, the republicanism in the classic French small town was the battle between the priest and the mayor. And so the church versus the state fought it out over the 19th century in France. And that and, and basically they destroyed, they destroyed, they, they confiscated the land of the church, they took it over with the state, they they and they they much of the state of the, of the state uh, took over the properties, the money, and and um, and had and so the, the classic was the Dreyfus affair in the 19th century when there was a scandal, uh, etc. But but basically the French Republican idea is destroy the church and it's open and so you and you have and France is the, is the most secular country in, in Europe when you ask general national samples of citizens the French are the, are the most, the most uh, not the most secular Poland and Ireland are the, are the, are the most religious and more religious than, than the US for political in part for political reasons but, they, but, they, they, but these are these are important drivers of, of other of other things. For sure. Other other questions or reactions or yes. Wondering how you um, exclude the negative civic association, like being part of gangs. Well, like what you say? Being part of a gang. Yeah. Yeah. Like if people. if if we had gang membership, we would love to use it. We don't have we don't have data on gang membership in the, in the general D, or the general main source of the DDB that I talked about. Uh, the uh, the census uh, would be a little sensitive if uh, the census asked people. And if you know if the New York Times heard the census was going to be asking about are you a member of a gang, what would happen? Okay, so it's not in the census. Uh, unions we do have, and and yet unions. Unions, we haven't analyzed that as much as we as as I as I want to, but um, 
what do we have other other data on unions that would that show this? That is, I mean, the, the way we try to answer something like that, something like this, not necessarily just use the raw data ourselves, but try to say, have other people done a study, say, of unions related to um, trust, so, so something like that. And we combine, in terms of, say, attitudes like trust uh, and membership, often individual data may be better than the geographic data. So we go back and forth in the, and roughly half the chapters in the, in um, the um, Kentucky Karaoke book are based on individual citizen survey data. Um, and the, where's the other half are based on it. So, um, so how do we answer? We, we do have union data. We don't. We don't have. We don't. We don't have data on gangs. We are at the end of the hour. Thank you for questions and and uh, participating. And we will. We'll get, yeah. Oh, we need. We, we, uh, well, we have a date for the midterm, which it, um, uh, our plan is to have it. What, there are two dates that are in the syllabus. We plan to have it on the Wednesday, not 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 not, not the one Monday. Okay, so that's we. I won't try to. I won't try to tell you the the, 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 the date, but it's it's in the it, it should it, it, it's it's in there in two places, and the, the plan is to have it just have it on Wednesday. If someone has a serious problem, there's one person who emailed. They're going to be traveling. They're getting a ticket to go fly internationally. We will we'll try to try to have a, a work out a special arrangement. Is it all right to take the midterm? Or? Yeah, it's required for undergraduate students. It's voluntary for graduate students. Because we have the option, right? Yes, yeah. yeah. We, we recommend everyone take it. That is, the more the more things you do, the more especially, I mean, that is, if you're a grad student, even if you're doing an MA, you want, you want, to, you want to work mostly on your MA, the more you read about all this other stuff, which is what you show if you take the exam, the more you'll be able to think more creatively about how, you know, that is if you just, if you're just doing a, you know, an MA narrow, but I mean, in terms of your, your idea of, of an MA on Brazil, uh, religious changes, secularization, I mean, these, these overlap with a lot of things. So, 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 so I mean, we, as it says, we recommend everybody, including grad students, they're going to take it, but it's not, it's not required for grad students. What's the format? Um, essay, maybe two two questions. You can write a write an essay on, on one of the or the essay one one of the topics. Second, identifications, maybe ten items, and you have to answer you know what are, what are these IDs for five, five or six of them. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, folks.